Hogsty presents It's Just Business with Steve Thomas and Rich Rogers. And now, here's your host, Chris Larry. Hello and welcome to another episode of It's Just Business on the Hogsty Network. We talk about the dollars and cents, the goings on, the media, and all things cash flow in the world of sports and sports business. Uh, it's a two-man crew tonight. Steve, how you doing? I'm doing all right. I wish I was rich because Rich is in the Bahamas right now. So instead, we're stuck, you know, working and doing podcasts. So I, I'm a little envious of that. But I'm happy to be here talking business as always. Awesome. And thanks very much to Alex for filling in with me on the la- for me on the last episode. Alex, of course, one of the mainstays on the Hogsty proper, the uh, mothership, if you will. So thank you, Alex. Um, we got a little bit of a machine gun run rundown of topics tonight. Probably some quick hitters, a bunch of them, but some good stuff. First, we'll stay in Redskins land and talk a little bit about the negotiations, the debates, and the wrangling of the Redskins in Richmond for training camp and some of the controversies and fiscal battles that that has kicked up over the last couple of years and is heating up this year, especially. Um, This is, I think, their fifth year in Richmond, Steve. Is that correct? It is the fifth of year of an eight-year deal. That is correct. And there's some debate about who is making money and how. And I, my sense is that Many in Richmond, although not the mayor, but many in Richmond's government have thought that they've been getting the uh, sort of ugly side of the stick in this one. Do you want us to give us a kind of a sure. rundown of where we're at? <laughs> yeah, well, of course, it's. I find it fascinating, you know, that they're mad about the deal that they agreed, signed and agreed to, you know. <laughs> so it's not like they're getting screwed on this thing. Everybody has a whole bunch of high-priced lawyers that did this. But, but the general gist of it here is that there was an eight-year contract we're in year five here so that's the first year was the first year of the robert griffin phenomenon and here we are in you know year five of that um and the general gist is that the city of richmond and with some help with the with the state of virginia built the redskins training camp the bond Secours redskins training camp and bond Secours being a healthcare provider i believe that is the the title sponsor the name sponsor to the place and the Redskins agreed to come down and have a whole training camp and all the pomp and circumstance that comes with them. But the real major hang-up in this thing and why the city of Richmond is mad is that there happens to be also an annual $500,000 payment slash bribe that the city of Richmond owes as a part of the deal to the Redskins every year. Now, uh, and that's a lot of money for a city, <laughs> you know, especially a city the size of Richmond, which, you know, is a city, but it's not exactly New York City, you know, which is where, which is where uh, Chris hails from, um, you know. And, and so the five hundred thousand dollars is a lot. And the general idea was that the increased um, tax revenue through hotels and cars and restaurants and shopping was going to pay for that, and that really hasn't come true. So that's the source of the controversy here. And so the first, you know, I guess the first question we need to talk about really is before we get into how the city feels, is I think that um, attendance in training camp has been a little low this year. It's been low in years past. So what is going on with attendance, first of all? Let's talk about that. What do you think? Well, I think a couple things. One, anytime you get further out from the fan core of the team, it's going to be harder to you know, pull in a larger fan base. And while the South historically was sort of the Redskins uh, fan base, you know, then Atlanta Falcons, Carolina Panthers, there's been teams and franchises that have come in over, you know, the many decades here that have kind of chipped away at that. So one, it's hard to draw fans that far away from the city that you, you know, that you call home. I think that's one problem. Uh, And then two, let's be honest, the traffic between the DC area and Richmond, especially from the DC area to Fredericksburg is just brutal. And uh, so that, I'm sure, if for people are thinking about the kind of spont- spontaneous trip down there or thinking, oh, maybe we'll spend a Saturday, that traffic can be, especially in summer, can be a big deterrent. Well, yeah, and I think that eliminates the idea of having it a day trip. 
you know, if you're going to spend five hours on the road down the I-95 corridor and then another five hours getting back, that's just utterly not worth it for most families. I mean, you can go through the local roads and everything, but I think you're absolutely right. That's part of it. And the other part, of course, is that the team just hasn't been as exciting. You know, let's let's be honest about the off season we've had too. We've had a bad off season, you know, for a variety of reasons. The Scott McGowan drama, you know, the uh, Kirk Cousins drama. We lost, you know, a couple stars of the team, and so there's not a ton of excitement. Um, but that's kind of. But the the big picture here is it's kind of been dwindling over the past several years, you know, and and when the city of Richmond all of a sudden realized, gosh, we shouldn't have been, we shouldn't have agreed to make a five hundred thousand dollar payment to the to the Redskins and how on earth are we going to keep doing that if attendance dwindles? I, I think the Redskins views that as as uh, not their problem. You know that is the city of Richmond's problem, and you know sort of too bad for you. Um, you know, so I, that's part of it. And, and, and we had on the Hogsty a representative of the city of Richmond last year before training camp, and she had a whole list of things to do. You know, in restaurants and hotels and kids stuff and all these things. That's what the city of Richmond wants. You know, that's what they want. They want families to do other things in the city. And it, the impression I get is that it's not happening. Yeah, there. I mean, I, I've lived in Richmond, so it's, it's a fine city. But you know, it's not. It. You know, especially, I mean, maybe you go to King's Dominion or you do a bunch of the culturals, but those things are pretty hard to jam into a, you know, day or to two or three days of Redskins football. Not like those things really mesh. And, you know, I also don't know if it's a whole family experience anyway in the way you'd get the the wife and the younger kids down to spend time in Richmond. I don't know how big a draw that is for the full package. Um so I, I think that's probably a miscalculation. I will say this. I wish that uh, Redskins officials were as shrewd negotiating with Kirk Cousins as they uh, <laughs> were with the city, with the taxpayers of Richmond. Um, you know? Well, you know, so, Bruce Allen's in his element, you know, with this with the city of Richmond. This is why I was so high on, on a stadium because this is Bruce, man. You know, he might not be able to evaluate football players, but he's sure as heck good at things like bilking the city of Richmond out of – you know, four million dollars. <laughs> you know, I, it, go ahead. I was wondering if there'd be any relief if the stadium does land in land in Virginia. I wonder if they get like a bargain rate on the next contract or get any any you know sort of buyback. I wonder if there's a whole Virginia package of that offers Richmond a little bit of a leg out. That's a creative thinking. You know, I would venture a guess not because what? Why do the Redskins? You know what? What incentive do the Redskins have to give a bargain to anybody? They've got two governments to play off each other to get a stadium at no bargain. You know, so I, you know, as far as them giving a bargain to City Richmond, what's but the interesting part about the Richmond is this. You know, the, the there's an article that came out. Uh, this is last year, April seventh, from the Richmond Times Dispatch's newspaper about there, and and it talks about. It was called, for the sake of argument here, a Redskins training camp deal with Richmond, a punching bag at mayoral debate. And there's a bunch of city councilmen and a bunch of mayoral candidates from back then talking about how horrible the Redskins deal was, how they don't, they didn't want to make the payment, how they didn't like the name Redskins, and all of these things. But if you fast forward to the current year, the mayor of Richmond is talking about how he wants the Redskins back and they're nego- trying to negotiate an extension you know so i think there seems to be a little bit of a dichotomy amongst the richmond leadership about exactly how much they like the redskins um well you know anytime there's a sticky issue it's going to be politically uh advantageous for people to pick opposite sides of so it doesn't surprise me that you have especially you know ramping up in election season um and a lot of folks taking jumping on either side of this so um and the mayor to me he's got to sort of hang tough with this a little bit so um he's got he can't look like he's going to pull out too early he's got to sort of stick with it and be the cheerleader rah rah type here so it doesn't surprise me how this is sort of falling along political lines in terms of for or against yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's always about money, but it's, you know, because the city of Richmond wants to make money, not lose money, but it's also about the prestige that the city has with an NFL team visiting for three weeks every year. So, you know, there, there's two things at play there, and we'll just have to see, you know, I think how it plays out. And it's the mayor's job. You know, we, we'll, 
as the executive yeah, to have the long view. Yeah, and listen, I mean, I will say this: when we contacted the city to get, uh, you know, to get the tourism coordinator on last year, I called the mayor's office, and they were very. We didn't have to beg them; they were very excited about you know interacting with us. They were very nice. They they actively wanted to get their stuff out, and she was like emailing us afterwards. And so it's not like they hate this; they just it's. If you hear controversy, it's really just about the money, and that's it. As as is ninety five percent of the world. Yeah, true that. <laughs> and I, I you know, yeah. if the traffic wasn't such a cluster, you know, two hours isn't bad. You could bounce down there for a day up and back if you knew you weren't going to sit in, you know, an additional two hours of traffic on top of the actual mileage. Yeah, you know, it's the I-95 corridor, though, you know, and that's just a problem. It, you know, it's not like the traffic would be any better, at, you know, if they did it out at Redskins Park, it would just be closer. Yeah, you just spend less time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's the Richmond training camp thing. Um, it's interesting. Again, we'll just have to see what happens here if the Redskins sign a new deal or not. You know, we stayed up at the Pennsylvania, air, you know, training camp site, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, for decades. You know, so I think if the Redskins make enough money at this, you know, they'll stick it out. Particularly, you know, the last thing I'll say, and I think we need to move on, um, watch to see what happens with the stadium deal. Because as you mentioned, Chris, um, if the Redskins end up getting a stadium in Virginia, I think it's safe to say that the state of Virginia will expect and probably demand that the Redskins stay in Richmond. (laughs) Whether or not there's another deal cut, you know, where they pay less money, who knows. But there's no way the rich city of Richmond is going to be happy if the stadium is in Virginia and they move training camp to, like, Maryland or somewhere. Right. That isn't going to happen. Right. <laughs> stadium in Virginia and training camp in Frederick. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, I was, I will, we'll follow that story. Um, and there's not much they can do about it this year. It is going to be what it is. Um, right. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about – QB salaries on the salary cap. This, of course, you know, was part of the discussion with with Kirk Cousins and thinking about, you know, what percentage of the salary cap he should have and this, that, and the other thing. I actually think, you know, Scott McLuhan, this would have been his, he was a stickler for, you know, value for quarterback towards, you know, percentage of the rest of the salary. So I think he kept us conservative in some of the time we might have been able to get him on what now would be a quarterback bargain. But so, you know, this issue is a is a hot button one in the league as we it's not just the amount of money that judge, you know, that you pay a quarterback, it's the percentage of your overall cap. And it's really those two factors that teams have to wrestle with. Yeah, you know, it, it's not so much um, the interesting part of this from the business perspective isn't that, you know, some guy's going to make $25 million. The interesting part is how do the teams manage the salary cap when quarterback salaries are escalating and escalating and escalating? And when we say escalate, I'm not really talking about the raw numbers. I'm talking about cap percentage. You know, how many teams out there uh, have quarterbacks with cap percentage over about 15%? You know, like looking at you, Ravens. You know, Tony Romo and the Cowboys, Drew Brees and the Saints, all those deals had massive, massive cap percentages. And the tricky part is if you have a quarterback that's that good, i.e. Drew Brees, uh, you you know, you want to keep him, so you have to pay him. But at the same time, that's when you start to see rosters get nuked. You know, and you start to see, you know, people not being able to, to be re-signed. Uh, you know, people move into other teams. People, you know, being forced to take pay cuts. So the interesting part from the business standpoint is how do, you, how do these teams toe the line knowing that these salaries and these cap percentages are going to continue to go up? Now, the Redskins did it by just refusing to, refusing to make Kirk Cousins an offer that was commensurate with the market. That was their answer. They just didn't do it, and by all means, they're just not going to do it. So, you know, we're probably going to move on here come next year would be the safe guess. Um, but other teams make different decisions, you know. The the Colts and Andrew Luck, you know, come to mind. Matthew Stafford's about to get a big deal. Um, and so, you know, what do teams do and what choice do they make? It's a fascinating question to me. Yeah, I agree. And I think there's some – it's interesting about – if you kind of look at the two – poster boys for this you know really lately have been as you say tony Ropo, tony romo and and joe flacco but they actually are sort of different cases in many respects in that you know part of the ravens calculus was a retrograde pay right like was 
back pay on the Super Bowl and and how much you know that was worth to them going forward, even if it ends up being kind of a regressive tax, so to speak. Um, but and Tony Romo, then you know you tank your and you get and there's nothing to show for it, right? You're not inviting him back in 15 years, and you know Super Bowl winning quarterback dot dot dot. So it's also interesting how the teams make that calculus about what the overall worth of the franchise is and what that quarterback has done going forward or in in reverse. See, is there a marketing thing here going on? You know, because because I can point to say the Lakers with the tail end of Kobe Bryant's career. You know, they they pay they they the last contract that Kobe Bryant had with the Lakers paid him about thirty million dollars a year in his last year. And, and as a player, I'm a huge Laker fan, love Kobe, but he won more thirty million dollars in his career. But from a marketing standpoint, he really actually was. If you add up the value, the increased value to the franchise in terms of ticket sales, you know, their cut of merchandising, media, you know, free free uh, you know media exposure, all those things, a player like that made Kobe Bryant worth from a financial standpoint at least $30 million if not from on the court basketball standpoint. My hunch is that the NFL is slightly different. I don't know if a guy say pick say Drew Brees. I don't know if Drew Brees has a marketing value to his franchise to the same extent that like a star basketball player would because the rosters are so much bigger and it's just a different deal. Um yeah, that's a good point. I think Drew Brees is actually an interesting one because if you, if any, he's probably on the very short list of players who have real deep marketing value, especially in that region, considering Super Bowl victory, considering post Katrina, considering the choice to come there. So he's probably on a very short list of highly marketable players nationally and regionally. But I totally agree that there really isn't that much value. I think teams just get stuck in feeling like they owe um, back pay on on. T- on players, especially quarterbacks that have delivered. Here's a question for you that might be interesting to think about. Does that make a quarterback that you brought in at a rookie in the rookie pay salary per rookie pay scale, even more valuable to develop and keep, even if you have to overpay and eat up a little bit more of your cap on that second contract, considering that they probably were such a a light drag on the initial contract. Um, you know, the Redskins are obviously a perfect example of that. You know, they, they brought in Kirk Cousins. He was dramatically underpaid in his last two years, you know, because he was on that fourth-round pick. And, and the Redskins just decided it wasn't worthwhile. You know, because I think you have to – if I were a GM of a football team, I think – you know, you bring up a very good point with the regressive tax, you know, which is basically like the Kobe Bryant contract, regressive tax. Drew Brees' contract, you could argue there's a regressive tax component to it. Although he's putting up monster numbers still, and he's you know you know he's what is he thirty six thirty seven years old at least at this point, um, but I think football teams maybe more than other team other sports because of the salary cap. Really, the best teams know that they have to pay for future performance and not past glory. You know that's where the you're absolutely right. The Ravens got in trouble with that. The Cowboys certainly did with the Tony Romo contract, and and the Ra- the Ravens or at least are still paying for it today <clears throat> you know and so i think the answer to your question is you know is some some teams are willing to do it and others are not um it seems like the redskins have made a choice by that by not giving kirk the long-term contract that they are just going to move on and probably find another rookie you know and so keep and so they're going to keep themselves out of that big money contract and meaning they're not willing to pay it you know, it seems like that's where the Redskins at least have shook out on it. Yeah, but it is, it's a quarterback league. So, it, you know, you can also look at the reverse. I mean, what, how many years of, of wasted time, money, resources go in when you have, uh, you know, you're in constant development mode or you have a black hole at that, at that position on the field? You're probably not going to succeed. Well, yeah, and the Redskins are probably worse than almost any other team in the league with that in that regard. I mean, we all know this long and sordid and ugly history of that. You know, and listen, I was all in favor of of giving Cousins a contract because I think from a contractual, uh, from a contract standpoint, from a salary cap management standpoint, they could have signed him to about, uh, you know, a contract with about a twenty six million dollar average annual value and still kept the cap number down to the point where they could have signed at least most of their other players. It just would have taken some finagling, but I think they could have done it. Um, you know, and, and I think most other teams 
would go your route, which is which which is what you just said is you know they're underpaying you know in the rookie deal, so they're willing to sort of go over a little bit, you know, and you know they're willing to go over a little bit on the second contract. But I think the Redskins seem to just be going contrary to the to to the you know contrary to the grain of of most other teams. You know, I mean, Kirk Cousins passed for forty nine hundred yards last year, which is an incredible amount. And they didn't resign him to a multi year deal. You know, yeah. And you have to have, you know, you've had to have spent wisely in those rookie deal years, you know, when the Redskins were mired in the cap penalty and various digging themselves out of their own problems. So it's not like they actually, you know, stocked the pond in that time either, which you have to have done. No, but they did find some quality players. You know, they drafted and signed Jordan Reed. You know, they drafted uh, Brandon Scherf, who, you know, he's a rookie, but it's a fairly large deal because he was a, you know, top five pick. They just re-signed Morgan Moses, you know, you know to the five-year deal. So they have uh, signed some players. Now, one could argue that the departure of Deshaun Jackson, the departure of Pierre Garçon, is that a part of this salary cap management thing? Or do they just, from a coaching standpoint, believe in Josh Doxson, you know, and are willing to keep him around on his rookie deal? You know, is this a – maybe this is a value thing here. You know, you're going to pay Josh Doxson less, for example. But if he can get to, like, say, 75% of what Pierre Garçon did, they're getting more ultimate value value per square inch, you know, if you will, and maybe that is w- more worthwhile to the team. Yeah, and we all, as fans of this team, we all know what the end game in, is here, that Cousins and Terrell Pryor Sr. have monster years, and they're both not on the team the following year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> But again, I just want to emphasize, I think you're right, and you know that's the nightmare scenario, but it seems to me that the Redskins are in a minority here and that most other teams would bite the bullet and pay the 15% cap, you know, cap space hit to the quarterback, you know, and just try to figure out the rest of the roster later. And, you know, you know and they're trying to minimize the cap hit in the later years, you know, to the extent they can, and the Redskins just said no, period. No, we're not doing it. And so that's their that's their answer to this. It's a uh, you know it's a little bit of a mystery uh, to me as to why they're why they think that. We will see. The era of great quarterbacks is starting to become in its twilight. So it'll actually be interesting to see if this even gets tighter as the quality quarterbacks that it goes down a little bit because we're going to see over the next three to five years some pretty monstrous people retire. You kind of start with uh, Peyton Manning and go from five or six years out. You're going to see the Breezes, the Bradys, the Manning Jr., you know, even your Matt Ryans. I mean, the quarterback, you know, field is going to thin even more. And so we'll see what that does to the already precious resource of quarterbacks. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe, you know, maybe the future is, you know, build the team around a mediocre quarterback. And, and you know, they're just not going to be willing to pay the monster deal. It's a it's a fascinating look at at how to run a business, you know. In that regard, you have a limited amount of resources. How do you allocate the resources? It's a it's a classic question applied to football. All right, so let's jump in totally out of the realm of football uh, and even American sports in general, and you know, follow a storyline that we've been keeping up with a little bit on it's just business, and that is kind of the money and politics of Olympic site hosts and uh over the last couple of weeks we got an announcement that los angeles will be hosting the 2028 summer olympic games which steve i know maybe you uh, were whispering in somebody's ear but the sort of <laughs> no. uh, first world nation ownership of the games is something you've talked about so you got to be happy about this yeah i'm happy about it you know i'm stunned that they did it you know the, the last time the summer olympics was in uh the united states unless i'm wrong was 1996 in atlanta so it's gonna have been you know what 32 years Years by the time this rolls around, I think it got to the point where the Olympic Committee just couldn't continue to ignore the elephant in the room by continuing to have Olympics that have questions and corruption charges and everything else, and you leave out the most powerful and the most uh, the nation in the world and the, in the country that has the biggest economy, and you're just not going to give them the Olympics ever. Uh, I, I think it, it came down to you know they have to had they have to get it right. They ha- finally have to have Olympic Games that goes, you know, a couple Olympic Games that goes right. Because if you notice, the other one they gave out was to Paris. Yeah. You know, and so that's another major city, a lot of money, you know, a lot of resources. The odds are that the Paris and L.A. Olympics are going to go well. 
you know, and I, I think, you know, I, I think the Olympic enemy is sort of done with the Sochi's, you know, of the world and the Rio de Janeiro's of the world for a while, just because they've had black eye after black eye pretty much in, in, um, you know, so the question is how much money is, is the city of Los Angeles going to have to spend on this? I have no idea. We'll have to follow this sort of going forward. My hunch is that they won't need to spend nearly as much money as other cities because they've already got half of these facilities ready. They have a transportation infrastructure set up already. You know, some of these facilities are there. I don't know if they're going to use the L.A. Coliseum, you know, or they're going to use the, the Rams' new stadium. You know, that's coming online in a couple of years. I would assume the Rams' new stadium is probably going to be the hub of it. You know, if I had to guess. So it's I, I applaud the Olympic Committee. I'm stunned that those bunch of USA haters finally came around, but I think they realized they just they had to the the controversy with these Olympic sites had to end. And so what do they do? They give them to Paris and LA. Yeah, California that was the fifth biggest economy in the country if it was its own yeah. or in the world if it was its own country. Yeah. So it's a pretty safe bet. And I think you're right. They needed a couple breathers, right? They didn't they you know, a couple ones that they can kinda not have to hold their breath through that the sewage is going to not, you know, let alone that games will run well or that they have the venues, but you know, people aren't kayaking in, in you know, <laughs> sewage water, sewage water and you know, <laughs> athletes aren't going to die while being, while competing. <laughs> right. Yes. Or that we're, you know, relocating entire towns, you know, into some, <laughs> you know, <laughs> unmentionable place. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, I mean, I know I get the sort of, you know, anti USA sentiment about it, but, you'd be hard pressed to find if you're going from a diversity inclusion concept in general, you'd be hard pressed to find a more diverse place than, you know, the LA area of California. So it's, it's certainly not like, yes, it's the United States, but it certainly has a diversity story that probably rivals most places in the world. So it's also kind of how you slice and dice it. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and clearly there's an anti USA sentiment amongst the Olympic committee and FIFA has shown it, you know, we haven't had a world cup, uh, soccer tournament in the U S for a long time either. Um, but it, it, again, I, I think at some point you just have to ignore the, you can't continue to ignore the elephant in the room and wonder why North America hasn't had an Olympic games in forever. <laughs> and so they finally saw that, but it's going to be a while, you know, we're all going to be old by the time it comes around. <laughs> yeah. Right. Don't coming. buy tickets yet. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you're going to be around for 2028 before you do it. <laughs> Right, yeah, and it's a it's a long it's a long term bet on the Olympic Committee on the United States too. So that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. It's a pretty um, safe bet, though, wouldn't you say? I know, I'm kidding. Um, Unless you know, yes. like North Korea ruins California for us or something, you know, then it may yeah, have a problem. You never know. <laughs> uh, we laugh now. Um, yeah, so we'll look forward to that. Uh, 2028. I think Paris is first, right? Yeah, it was Paris, Paris is and- first. Yeah, Paris is first. And I know that the jockeying there over the last couple of months has even been which one was going to go first and which one was going to go second, less about whether each either city was going to get that. Yeah, I think it's just one last poke in the eye. It's just, you know, okay, we're going to, we have to give it to the United States, but we're going to give it to you, the, you know, second place. Yeah. <laughs> um, and speaking of the L.A. area, we've also, you know, as the ball family turns, and quite frankly, we could we could stick our, you know, hand in a bag full of topics with ball and just pick one and go at random. We could probably do um, a LeVar Ball podcast if we wanted to. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> we'd probably get him on if we got enough listeners. Um, so there's some controversy lately, you know, just, st- you know, there's a couple of themes with him, Run, right? It's just his kind of bullish personality. Uh, and the the marketing angle of that. There's obviously the shoe deals and the sort of family cottage industry that he and his family have created out of basketball. And then there's obviously his rising profile as his sons start to, you know, matriculate into the into professional sports. But this one we're gonna talk about today is kind of, you know, centered around the AAU tournament and is all of this just kind of a bit of a cover and a song and dance routine around these various shoe deals. Uh, so, Steve, do you want to tell sure. us what you think? Yeah. You know, well, first of all, uh, you know, what happened here is that LeVar Ball has an AAU team that he coaches called, I think, the Big Ballers. Is I think is the name of the team. And this is a fairly big-time team, obviously. Lonzo was a part of it, you know, when he was a kid. And, you know, and, and so this is not your local AAU team. They're playing at very high levels. So they were at a tournament in Las Vegas. Now, this tournament was sponsored by um, Adidas. 
you know, because, you know, these big shoe companies sp tend to sponsor, you know, the big time tournaments. And what happened was, is that LeVar um, blew up on the court and ended up getting a female referee tossed, which is ironic. It, you know, the, the female referee assigned him a technical because he was acting like a jerk on it. And then so LeVar pulled his team and then complained to Adidas and Adidas got uh, got her ended up got. Uh, sorry, end up getting her replaced. Um, you know, first of all, you know, what we've seen here is misogynistic LeVar, and we've seen misogynistic LeVar before. So that's one issue. And the other issue is why would Adidas do this? I don't know, you know, how what kind of sports, you know, your kids play, Chris. You know, mine do. And never have in my life, you know, we, we're into baseball, not basketball, but never in my life have I ever seen a coach get an ump replaced. Um and so the scuttle put on the street was whether Adidas was doing this as sort of an overture to make LeVar happy to hopefully sign Lonzo to an Adidas shoe deal, which is interesting. Of course, everybody denies it, and, oh, we would never do that. But, you know, they're clearly catering to LeVar in one way or another. <laughs> well, the fact that yeah, you're right, I've never seen that either, um, and that's from Pee Wee Sports all the way through the pros, you know, I mean – coaches general managers game the system all the time and you you very rare, rarely see that you know these controversies and the drama and the dust-ups ever actually affect the officials in this way even after some pretty major mess-ups in the nfl and other places so it's pretty remarkable that he could get a ref fired and i think it it's got a point to something and the the and this might be a good future show topic, but also just the AAU and all of this basketball money culture around these leagues and these high school leagues and, you know, these traveling teams. This is all so shady at its core um, at so many levels. So am I surprised at all that LeVar Ball or someone else that's playing at that level has an effect on how these leagues are run and managed, not in the slightest, because the whole thing is crooked. Yeah, especially in AAU, and I think you're right. I think that's another that, – that may be a good show topic for another day because I think AAU basketball more than baseball – and football really doesn't have these leagues because of the injury risk, but baseball has all these select teams, but it's not nearly as corrupt and crooked as AAU is. But I'd just like to point this out before we move on from this, because um, first of all, I think you're absolutely right. There's something else going on here, and clearly Adidas has an agenda. Nobody would just replace a ref, particularly when she did, really didn't do anything wrong. Um, but you know, I've defended LeVar on this show, and I think you have too, Chris. Uh, you know, because I think that most of his marketing stuff is just nonsense and it's just marketing and, you know, his mouth rather is just nonsense and it's just he's marketing shoes and he's trying to be bombastic and it's all kind of in good fun. But this is the second time we've seen him kind of beat up on women. I don't mean physically, but, but verbally beat up on women. Let's clarify. Because we had the controversy with Colin Cowherd's female co host, whatever her name, I can't remember her name where he was rude to her, and now he's rude to this female ref. And so this is the ugly side of LeVar Ball. Um, this is the misogynistic side. I saw. I said this before. Um, you know, this is LeVar Ball uh, treating a female in charge differently than he would treat a male in charge. I don't think he would try to get a male um, uh, referee fired. I don't think he would have been quite as rude to a male ref, even though he denied, you know, he did it, of course. I think this is the this is the side of LeVar Ball that uh, is not quite as fun loving and is not and is much more serious. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think it's been pretty apparent that uh, Ball's got a bit of a you know woman problem, so to speak, and which is a shame because, as you said, I actually I'm actually at the you know entertained by most of what he does, and also sort of think of it as very appropriate in our 21st century kind of news and sports entertainment culture. It's I think it's actually the way to get ahead. So it it actually shows that maybe he's not as a smart a marketer and a PT Barnum type as we give him credit for when, you know, when he can't even, you know, control his boorish behavior because those are the kind of things that the culture will flip on you quick, you know, and if it's this prevalent where he 
actually can't rein it in, then eventually it's gonna he's gonna put a hand on someone, or it's gonna be something where you know it it flips from you know eye roll to pariah. Yeah, that's true, and, and I think the other thing that needs to be mentioned out of this is that he's filming a reality show for Facebook right now. We talked about this on a prior show, but you know, at the time that this AU tournament was going around, he had cameras in his face. There were boom mics there, and they're following around for the show. So, you know, is he tr- is he being bombastic like this uh, just for the show, or is this really just truly his misogynistic side coming out? And I. You know, I don't know the man at all, and neither do you, but I tend to think we've caught a glimpse into a little bit of the true LeVar, and I think, you know, if you give him true serum, some of this stuff is really in his character, uh, you know, and that's, you know, obviously that's not good. And live by the internet, die by the internet, right? Yeah. So, like, if and if you're you're micing your life up this much, you know, the internet will turn on you so quick. So, you know, and if he isn't in control of his tongue and his actions, it you know the courses will be reversed. Yeah, and listen, there's been no impl- indication that Lonzo Ball is going to sign with Adidas. You know, you know, uh, you know, the word on the street is that you know that he's not going to do that. Uh, you know, he seems to be all in with the big baller brand in terms of the shoes. And, and, and by if the su- NBA Summer League, which ended two weeks ago, three weeks ago, is any indication, Lonzo it looks like is going to be a legitimate player because he did really well. He was the MVP of the Summer League. You know, he was, you know, he had triple doubles in the Summer League. So I think if I were the Ball family, I would want to play it out and see how he does in the lake with the Lakers uh, before I went off and, you know, gave a piece of the pie out to some other big shoe company at this point because you know it could blow up if if lonzo blows up and he's on that track and he's not playing in milwaukee so he's got lots of opportunities if they do it right exactly right um so i'm sure uh lavar and company will give us uh more show topics in the future especially as the nba season starts to round the corner and we actually get to see him on the big court and his brothers continue to to get through and Amateur athletics. Um. <laughs> Amateur, quote-unquote, athletics. <laughs> yeah. You know, because right, it's like, you know, Leandro is about to be a reality show star, for God's sakes, and this kid is like 15 years old. You know, it, it's truly blurring the lines between amateur and professional and, and everything else. And I, I don't know. It's, you know, I, you know, if LeVar wants to bring cameras into his life, fine, but have a little bit of a problem with a high school athlete doing that. You know, it's. I think we're going down a direction that's ultimately probably not very good with that. Yeah, and our profession, our pro am concept of sports is fairly antiquated at this point, especially at that level. Yeah. Um. Sure. All right, so we're going to go on to our final topic here, which is <clears throat> kind of bringing it home full circle back to the Redskins and the business of the Washington Football franchise, and that is their recently announced deal to switch from Coke to Pepsi. Uh, And um, I I happen to like Pepsi, so that was fine with me. I'm a Pepsi over Coke guy. Um, And also, Pepsi's local. So some interesting, or more local than Coke, for sure. Uh, So some an interesting update. I don't know how much we can read into this other than the fact that big big brands, you know, still want to play with Daniel Snyder. Um, Yeah, no, I I happen to have negotiated some of these deals for football teams and i'm here to tell you that this is not like you know daniel snyder just you know is tired of coke and you know he wants pepsi <clears throat> and it's big this is bigger people don't understand this this is bigger than just who's going to serve you know what drink is going to be served at the stadium this is a all-encompassing marketing agreement um you know Pepsi's going to be the sponsor they're going to have you know there's all sorts of things that go on with this it's a lot bigger deal than just what drink is going to be poured at the stadium and it always comes down to money. I can guarantee you the Redskins couldn't care less what drink is in FedEx Field. It's not about that at all. It's only about one thing. It's about what uh, company is going to pay the most money, period. Period. You know, because we're this deal probably in today's world, we're talking, you know, $60, $70 million probably, if not more, probably more than that uh, now you know over a number of years and so it's strictly a revenue stream you know for the redskins and that's all it is it has nothing to do with like you know the the coke has been with the redskins for decades now but has nothing to do with 
the tradition of Coke and the Redskins. It has nothing to do with, you know, Dan Snyder's wife likes to drink Diet Coke or something, and, you know, I don't know what she drinks, but it has zero to do with that, and it has only to do with who's going to pay him the most money. In this case, it was Pepsi. You know, so what we're going to see is we're going to start to see a lot of Redskins Pepsi events. You're going to see some more signage, you know, on the stadium, of course, but you're going to see Pepsi become kind of prevalent in Redskins talk. Uh, you know, now that this deal is signed. So it's, um, you know, in case anybody was wondering about it, all it is is about who paid them the most money. And that's it, period, the end. I was holding out for RC Cola, but they, they think they're <laughs> distant, yeah. distant runners. So <laughs> let's, let's flip the calculus a little bit because I totally hear what you're saying. What do you think is the motivator for Pepsi to come in and outbid Coke, especially with a team like the Redskins? <clears throat> Well, it's market for them. It's marketing. You know, you know. I dealt with Coke, and I've to have dealt with Coke and these things. And um, you know, it's it's yes, it's advertising. But for these companies, more it's it's not that they care so much that there's a sign in FedEx Field. They care about the prestige of being able to say that the that the Washington Redskins are a Pepsi entity. You know, and and believe me, they are very protective of 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 protecting their turf you know they do not want you know pepsi does not want coke in anywhere in the building they don't want coke even in the front offices you know they want it is pepsi period and so it's not so much that they think that you know that they want to be able to sell you know you know i don't know two million you know pepsi drinks a year or whatever the number is it's the prestige of being able to say the Pepsi now has 15 NFL teams. 15, it's 15 is the number, um, and so it's kind of a big picture marketing standpoint. It's you can uh, equate it, I think, sort of to like advertising at the Super Bowl. Advertising in the Super Bowl is not about so much, you know, they want to sell another, you know, a few widgets. It's about establishing a marketing presence more than anything. You know, that's why you at you. That's why you buy a commercial time at the Super Bowl. And that's why these marketing deals with with NFL teams are there. It's not about selling drinks. It's about establishing a presence in the marketplace that's bigger than their rival. You know, and the rivals for Pepsi are Coke and Dr Pepper. You know, and so Pepsi, if they can get more NFL teams than Coke does, they kind of have a bigger footprint, and that helps the company as a whole. We should do a uh, special. It's just business. Uh, Hogstye Twitter poll to see if people will switch their cola brands now that Pepsi is the official soft drink of their Washington Redskins. Well, it's funny you say that because we did get some Twitter comments on on the Hogstye Twitter feed about it, and people were not very happy that Coke was gone. I just can't believe anybody cares. <laughs> yeah. Is it really that important? You know, <laughs> which you can't, Coke, yeah, right? Which death sugar water you ingest? Yeah, exactly. You're gonna. It's gonna. All of it's gonna kill you anyway. <laughs> True but that. Pe- people seem to care quite a bit about it, though. So anyway, to answer your question is, to wrap, put a bow on this, it's it's less about they want to sell drinks and it's more about establishing a bigger footprint on, a, on the national marketplace than the rival. That's what it's about. So, Steve, occasionally on It's Just Business, we kind of go out on a kind of a look ahead, a little future casting. What's a sports business story that will be – kind of tracking and looking at probably for future episodes over the next weeks and months. Uh, so it'd be good to get out on that. I'll, I'll start, give you a little time to think. I'm actually super, you know, I mean, there's lots to be excited about with the coming NFL season, obviously. Um, and I'm even strangely a little bullish on the skins this year, but that I'm sure we'll get dashed soon enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm actually very curious to see what the ratings are like in that sort of first quarter of the season, that first quarter to the half. You know, it was at the election last year. Is there a downward turn? You know, are the primetime games sputter out of the gate? I think there'll be a lot of interesting, you know, one year you can throw out to all a bunch of anomalies and blah, blah, blah. Year two, still early, but you can start to spot trends. So I'm kind of really curious about the ratings for the NFL season. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that's very interesting. Um, I and uh, I think it's going to be a fascinating look because you're absolutely right. It's it is it a trend or was it was it a blip on the radar scope? For me, I've been I've said this before when you bring this when you bring the look ahead up. We are going to do a Super Bowl a Super Bowl um, 
um, topic on this show. We're going to do a Super Bowl segment where we talk about the business of Super Bowls because it's fascinating to me. And we haven't gotten around to that, and that's my fault, but we are going to take a hardcore look at what the Super Bowl is really about and uh, how it happens and the development of it and all the rest of it. We're going to do that. We just haven't yet. Yeah, I do look forward to that. That it will be a fun episode. And I'll give a little shout-out to, you know, since we're sports gabbers now, the recent 30 for 30 on Mike and the Mad Dog was very entertaining. If any of you know who Mike and the Mad Dog were, they were legendary New York City sports talk hosts. Um, you can and, tell that you're a New York-centric dude. <laughs> well, I mean, DC Roots originally, but I did listen to a lot of Mike and the Mad Dog. But they invented sports talk for all intents and purposes, or at least popularized it. I'll give right. Ken Beatrice the original score. Um, but it's a fascinating for 30 for 30 and a lot of fun. So if you're looking for that. Yeah. No, they yeah, and they did invent – you're right. I mean, I'm not a big – you know, New York sports, you know, talk show person, but I, it, certainly they did it probably first realistically. You know, we went from, um, you know, the only sports talk you would get were the post game, you know, the post game call in segment. You'd have an hour after Redskins games where you could call in and then it would end, you know. And so when Mike and the Mad Dog came around, it all of a sudden became a 24 hour, seven day week cottage industry. And, and as much as I hate to say it, yeah, you do have to give them credit for it. Hate to hate to admit that that New York is responsible for anything good. <laughs> All right, um, Steve. I know that you're famous mystery man online, True. but they can find at least a version of you at the Hogstye Twitter account. You're on, active on there, right? Yes, it, it's uh, more me than anyone else typically during the day. So if you want to get hold of me, that's probably the best place to do it. I will odds are I I, I might see it. <laughs> <laughs> I will do my best to see. We get a lot of comments. I will do my best. It find. is a fun, active Twitter feed. And also, especially the, now with Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And um, I don't want to, you know, I'm a company man for the Hogstide Network, but it's a good time to plug that because there's a lot of great training camp content. So, yes. you know, on all those social channels, you can get a, probably, you know, high, not higher quality, but just, you know, stuff that you're not going to be able to get on the, the regular year um, on the Hogstide now. So, and you can find me at ChrisLarry33 on Twitter. Um, I'd love to – one thing we need to do on this show is start to get a little bit more sort of in-between episode chatter. So maybe I'll take that on as a project, Steve. Absolutely. Do that. You're absolutely right. We do need to do that. That would be fun. And we want to get the audience uh, more involved. So that's always a good thing. All right. So – Thanks for joining us. We'll be back in two weeks. I'm sure Rich will be back from the Bahamas, uh, and we'll be jumping back into the fray. And the sports world and the sports business world is going to start heating up now as summer starts to wane and we kick into the fall. Uh, we'll have a lot more to discuss as we get it. baseball playoffs, football kicking off, and all the dust that that kicks up. So we will talk to you soon. Talk to you later. Bye. <laughs>